Hi, good evening, good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us for our webinar today uh, on the future of arts and culture. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, we'd really love to hear from you. So if you could uh, type in the chat actually where, you, where you're joining us from, uh, it always gives us a really nice uh, indication, you know, uh, who we're speaking to, because we can't see you. <laughs> Uh, but if you could let us know actually where, where you're joining us from, uh, that would be really wonderful, uh, wonderful to hear. So my name is Cheryl Chung and I'm the Program Director of Executive Education Singapore Futures here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, National University of Singapore. And uh, welcome uh, to our webinar series, uh, Futures Forward. Um, you know, Futures Forward uh, really aims to provide a platform for both futures practitioners as well as policymakers to uh, share insights, exchange ideas about how uh, futures is practiced, um, you know, across different domains, uh, different policy contexts in Asia, you know, and we really hope to uh, kind of expand this conversation with the community of practice, uh, both in Singapore as well as uh, beyond. So welcome. Uh, this is our first a webinar for the year. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've been, uh, for, for those of you who've been following us for a while, uh, you know, we've been uh, doing this, uh, this is our second season. We did a se one se full season last year where we focused very much on futures and public policy, uh, you know, public management issues, especially across Asia. What does it mean for organizations, that kind of thing. Uh, but this year we are taking a slightly different take. So this particular season for the year 2021 is going to be focused more thematically, you know, so future of X. So every, and we are going to increase our frequency to uh, monthly. Uh, over the next few months. So, it, but it gives me great pleasure to maybe start to introduce our topic, um, you know, for today. So we're talking about the future of arts and culture, you know, and really looking at it, uh, I think both in, in multiple ways, right? But I think firstly interested uh, in it as from a topical perspective, right? So really thinking about uh, you know, the future of the art, arts and culture itself, you know, what are the trends that might be interesting coming up, uh, what the new scenarios look like, you know, uh, you know, what are maybe um, different trajectories, you know, uh, different pathways that arts and culture might take. And then that's one area, you know, that we'd be very interested to discuss today. But I think the other area that is potentially really interesting is also how arts and culture contributes to future thinking, right? And how we think of, understand, explore, um, make sense of the future as well, you know, so kind of having a little bit of that interplay, I think, will, I hope will be a make for an interesting and fun conversation. Uh, it's really nice to see some uh, uh, friends in the chat. So hi, Roberto, Daniel, Tanya, uh, uh, Ahmed, and so on. Uh, really nice to see all of you. Uh, welcome uh, to our webinar. So maybe what I can do is do a quick introduction. So, you know, we're very lucky to always have the support of, uh, you know, wonderful uh, community of practice, uh, friends, fans, uh, you know, and so on, all who have, uh, you know, their own deep domain expertise, you know, to come and, and speak on these topics. Um, so for today, we, you know, in the topic of uh, future of arts and culture, uh, we have a number of, uh, uh, speakers that we, you know, I would like to introduce to you right now. Um, so the first speaker is Scott Smith, uh, founder and managing partner of Changes, uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, then we have uh, Annette Mies, artistic director of Audience Lab, based in the UK. Uh, Nicholas Larson, uh, senior advisor for the Copenhagen uh, Institute for Future Studies, uh, based in Denmark. And Paul Tan, who is a poet and also the former deputy CEO of the Arts uh, National Arts Council here in Singapore. So everybody joining us from all over the world, uh, really excited to have a conversation around, um, you know, uh, what the future of arts and culture looks like. So maybe what we'll do as a as a start is I'll in invite uh, each of the speakers to uh, offer some opening remarks, uh, you know, just uh, light provocations, I will say, <laughs> you know, just to get the conversation going and get us all warmed up to give us some things to think about, uh, and then we can we can take the conversation from there. Uh, I, I should say that part of this, uh, the reason why we picked this topic for our very first start uh, was actually an email that came in from a friend of myself and Scott's, uh, you know, who, who said, 
hey, look at this project that Scott has just completed, uh, you know, on the future of arts and culture, you know, and, and, uh, and, and looking at the project and, and uh, you know, some of the findings and, and so on, uh, really, I think, was the, the genesis story of how we came to this particular topic, uh, you know, for, for this webinar. So if we can start with Scott, uh, and maybe if I can say a few, a few more words uh, about Scott, uh, we've, we've worked together in, I would say, floated, <laughs> floated past each other in various projects for a very long time. Um, you know, and, and as mentioned, Scott is the managing partner of Changest, uh, has worked with many global organizations and governance bodies, uh, you know, all across the world in Futures work. Um, but I think one of the, 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 his more recent projects, which I'm a huge fan of, is his book, uh, which I've recommended to many of you. I'm sure we have many people who are who've been in our classes, uh, but it's the co-author of a book, "How to Future uh, Leading uh, and Sense Making in the Age of Hyper Change." Uh, but maybe if I can invite you, Scott, uh, to share a little bit about your project and uh, sure. what does the future of arts and culture look like for you? Thank you, Cheryl. It's I mean it's always a pleasure to to have an opportunity to float by you and to. Uh, <laughs> to, to work with this community and it's great to, to meet Nicholas and Paul today um, and we can talk a little bit about having worked with Annette um, and I, this is a short little block so I'm not going to attempt to kind of go into depth but um, about mid-March of 2020 when COVID was really beginning to kind of build steam of course we didn't even us as futurists didn't really kind of know what that looked like or what that meant um, I was actually on a uh, about to step on a flight to Singapore to uh, visit with the Art Science Museum, Art Science Museum um, that everyone I'm sure there is familiar with, um, run by uh, the fabulous Honor Harger. And I was going to be working for a day with the team, um, uh, the team of the museum, sort of thinking about what the future of arts and culture might look like, um, not necessarily explicitly around COVID. Uh, and in the end, uh, about two hours before boarding, I didn't catch that plane. Uh, because uh, a friend of a friend that I've been in contact with had contracted COVID. Um, so then we began kind of scrambling, thinking about like, well, what's going to happen if people can't visit these you know, wonderful institutions, they can't um, be in public together, they can't experience things together, what happens next? And I think a lot of people in the, the arts and culture sector were beginning to have the same thought at the same time. Uh, and not long after, um, uh, Annette threw out a, a kind of question on, on Twitter. Um, sometimes the most wonderful things come from Twitter. And uh, we began to kind of talk about, well, how could, we, how could we get at this issue? How could we talk to people around the world about what they see happening? Uh, and can they even see through the pandemic to the other side right now? Um, and through a long conversation and uh, kind of bringing other folks together, we uh, tapped a tool that was created by a friend of ours uh, to try to convene that conversation, even when people couldn't travel. So we ended up bringing together, I think, uh, somewhat over 200 uh, professionals from institutions, galleries, museums, performing arts, uh, funding bodies, uh, critics, um, uh, you know, people who are kind of adjacent to the sector to ask that question, what are the kind of big drivers of change over the next decade? Uh, and how do we think that will play out? And I'll just give you a really quick, um, I'm actually going to put the URL in the chat, where people can actually download things themselves and spend a bit more time with it. But can you, if you can see the, um, uh, the PDF up on my screen, um, we, yeah, we reached out to about 200 plus people. And got a wonderful response from all over the world. The best thing about this project was we got to speak to people in practically every, um, every region uh, and uh, ended up with having them come back with about 500 different sort of drivers or impacts of change that they foresaw in the sector over the next, um, over the next decade. And what we were able to do with this tool was to, to allow people to um, either choose from a kind of uh, a menu of drivers of change that they were presented with or build their own uh, and use other people's. And we ended up having effectively a kind of asynchronous conversation that lasted about, I think, almost 60 days, um, having people kind of chime in from around the world. And it generated this amazing <laughs> data set. Uh, we sort of think of this as a kind of cloud of connected issues 
that um, we then had the challenge of going in and beginning to sort of parse and look for. And what we found really interestingly was as much as we thought people might be pointing to the pandemic as you know, the big driver of change, what most people were doing was kind of looking through that um, and realizing the extent to which, if anything, it was going to accelerate the pressure on business models, on profitability, on how uh, institutions can actually st uh, basically self-sustain. Less about the sort of mission that they were perhaps you know, put to and more about how they would sort of keep themselves afloat. And so a way to look at this graph very quickly is that the sort of biggest, reddest issues here are the ones that were selected by these 200 participants as the most important. Um, business models came first, but interestingly, just behind that, but also um, impacting effectively everything in this kind of um, uh, cloud of issues was, uh, sorry, was climate change. Um, so even kind of thinking past business models, climate really came up as sort of the major issue that, that uh, all of these experienced professionals and leaders in the arts and culture sector thought was going to be really the shaping factor. Uh, and then in fact, the reason they were looking at business models was because they could feel already um, that funding, for example, was going to be diverted, that attention was going to be diverted, that support and a lot, you know, sort of public effort was going to be eventually turning towards grappling with, you know, what Timothy Morton calls a hyper object, this sort of issue of such scale that we can't uh, really grasp it. Um, and so uh, the three different scenarios kind of came out of this piece of work uh, that uh, really focused one around um, the effective business models and how that's kind of bifurcating um, the types of, of uh, productions and performances and sort of cultural um, uh, creations that, are, that may survive, either the very big and spectacular or the very small. Um, it also brought forward the sort of need for diversity and how generational change uh, in arts and culture would be potentially kind of counterbalancing that economic pressure to put more emphasis on um, arts and culture as an instrument of social change uh, and how we could explore the sort of issues that we're experiencing during climate change by being a more effective global community. Um, and then the sort of the third scenario really looked at kind of the impact of digital tools and platforms, uh, everything from the metaverse to NFTs to direct kind of artists to audience relationships, economic and non-economic. So um, just to kind of wrap that up, that, those were sort of the three outcomes of it, but what it really did was pose a series of questions around um, how we navigate through this, how we balance um, the, uh, the innovations and technology that are coming with the need to be accessible to uh, a vast kind of diversity of audiences. Um, and how to kind of recenter arts and culture as an effective tool of um, social change, social critique, and growth uh, over the next decade, even as these economic pressures are are on us. Um, maybe a little more over four minutes, but hopefully that kind of wrapped everything up um, in. Uh, let's see if I'll stop sharing here. Wrapped everything up kind of in a a package really quickly to sort of set us off. But um, that was the, the work in a nutshell. I, I urge you to explore it in more depth. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are following online, uh, we put the link up uh, in the chat. So if you've got a little bit more time, you can also take a look at that. Um, you know, and explore explore kind of the depth of the work, which is a bit too difficult to cover in just four minutes. Uh, we haven't done justice to the project at all. But I think that, you know, the, the thing that um, really struck me about what your remarks, uh, your opening remarks, Scott, was, uh, I guess, also the moment in time, right? The beginning of the pandemic and, you know, kind of, so like this is a zeitgeist moment of, for arts and culture. And I remember doing a session of uh, scenarios with the Art Science Museum, you know, and, and I mean, it was a real reckoning, right, about what the identity of a particular arts institution like a museum might be, um, you know, and how to use futures thinking as an anxiety coping mechanism, right, in a, in a time like that. 
um, because I think so much of it goes down to the, the fundamental, almost existential questions about, you know, what do these institutions do and are they actually prepared for the future, you know, and how do they kind of contribute to building or creating that future? Um, I think that, that that to me was really what struck me. Um, the big takeaway from the, the set of scenario projects that we did, uh, the, the workshops that we did with the art science was going back to the word curator, you know, as a caretaker, yeah. right? you know, um, and, and thinking, you know, so that there's this part of it, which is like, the future is so big and messy and, and you know, kind of emergent and a little bit crazy, but there's also a returning back, right? Mm -hmm. um, kind of the core, uh, you know, identity also, which I find very fascinating. But thank you so much for your, for your remarks. Uh, maybe, sure. I, maybe I can um, ask Annette, uh, you know, so Annette is the Artistic Director of uh, Audience Labs and I see a visiting scholar as well, um, uh, sorry, visiting research fellow uh, in the Culture and Creative Industries at King's College London. Uh, so uh, you worked on this project with Scott, so maybe you could uh, share a little bit about your take uh, on the project and maybe on uh, the future of arts and culture more generally. Uh, yes, thank you so much for inviting us, Cheryl. It's it's a really interesting forum for me to speak about this project. So I've worked in arts and culture for over 20 years now, um, and I've always been really interested in art and culture really as a space for collective imagination. So there's something really beautiful about the history and the and the um, the function of arts and culture as a space where people gather to look back, to look forward, to have experiences out of the everyday, to really think about who we want to be together, how do we want to live together, how, how are we good humans. And I think, for me, that's always been the joy of, of working in a, of, create, of having a creative job, and, and but also really thinking about the infrastructure of culture, what culture is for and what its role is. And what we see over you know, the 20 years that I've been working in it, but also over history is, is a swing back and forth between um, a, a instrumentalism and art for art's sake. And I think that's really interesting and the distinction is often made, but it's not necessarily very helpful. So, because it's, it isn't one or the other. I think, I think imagination and creativity is part of a healthy society and figuring out how it connects well and better with um, policy, with uh, the social sciences, with um, uh, charities, how it engages with the big ideas, but also how it, how it influences impact or the thinking about what's important right now, I think is where, where the interestingness lies. So I, as Scott was mentioning, when at the start of the pandemic, a lot of questions were spotlighted that I think were present within the arts industry for a long time. It's been fragile, economically fragile, um, sociologically fra fragile. It, it struggled with um, some big questions, I think, already before the pandemic. But the pandemic also really... Um, uh, broke business as usual. And so the existential questions you spoke of really came to the forefront. And that's really the, the genesis of this project as well, where we as a group really wanted to look at, so what does the future look like? What do we all think right now is important? And what do we think, uh, where do we think the possibilities are? And I think like everyone, I experienced the existential crisis uh, and this project has been really helpful of giving that a place and a space. I think what uh, Scott's work points towards um, is a snapshot of what, of what everyone's thinking about, but he's been able to digest that in a really helpful series of scenarios. And Scott talked about the first scenario, um, which is about spectaculars and small spaces. And I think that's where a lot of the anxiety about what will survive and what the infrastructure is that is needed for art and culture to thrive, which is great. And it's really important because I think that's a big question right now for art and culture. How, how do we, how are we? But I think the real interest for me lies in scenarios two and three. So the, the second scenario speaks about a global network of connections. So this is where I get really excited and hopeful about the role of art and culture because it starts to say, 
actually we're not talking about separate art forms. We're not talking about separate institutions. We're not talking about, we're talking about a sector that is that uh, through, through imagination, through its work, uh, can become a network of imagination. It can bring different audiences together around big ideas. It can create spaces that are hard to create in daily life. It can start creating partnerships with each other, create connections between communities to exchange ideas, uh, but also extend those partnerships into different sectors. I think there is a real appetite right now, which I think might is a sort of silver lining from the pandemic and the breaking of business as usual. I th there's a real appetite right now within arts and culture across the globe. And again, this report points towards it to create partnerships that go beyond arts and culture that really help explore those big ideas that again are mentioned in the report. And we all know this, it's about diversity, it's about equity, it's about climate change, these big global questions that will require a lot of our imagination to even start addressing them and, and they're global. So I think for me that there is something really interesting about the role of arts and culture as a space of imagination in larger partnerships for how we address, how we live together in the future. And then the third one is about platforms and the multiverse. And I think arts and culture both loves and uh, uh, struggles with new tools sometimes. It's trying to find its place within this quite commercial, um, commercially driven technological world. And I think, uh, but I think the possibilities of digital to connect local communities, to think about how we have hybrid experience, how we, how we connect cross geographies and start imagining global collaboration, I think, you know, arts and culture can be a testing bed for that. How do we use technology beyond a space of commercialism? How is it a place of gathering? How is it a third space where we can think about digital placemaking? What does public space in a digital world, what does that look like? And I think there is an appetite for arts and culture to be a partner uh, and a, an R&D bed to explore what those futures look like. So I think for me, that's those are some of the exciting things that have come out of this report. And those are the kind of things that I think I and many with me are really interested in exploring um, in the future as part of futuring uh, and uh, in connection with policymaking. Fantastic. I think so much of what you said uh, really resonates with me. I think as a, uh, you know, as somebody who's a wannabe artist, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, it's this, you know, in complexity, we're look, always looking for this, you know, non-instrumentalist place and space, right, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and where is this space for imagination and innovation, right? Um, and I think that there are, there are many tools that are much more, that, that the arts world is much more comfortable with, that I think the policy world can learn from, you know, especially in this, uh, in the, you know, test bidding and, and, you know, uh, those are words that are very, we're very comfortable with in the kind of technology, kind of engineering kind of space. But, but you know, the same ideas, you know, exist in policy making, in, in arts and culture, uh, and then I think that that's something that is uh, worth exploring. I mean, even for public policy schools, right? You know, uh, I sent my leadership team to do some theatre, uh, you know, for for one of our programs. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, as, as an exploration, right? Why don't policymakers, you know, kind of get their hands dirty in, in this space, right? Why does why do we think that econometrics is the only way, or well, you know, whatever other tools are the only way to go? Anyway, food for thought, a lot of food for thought. Fantastic, thank you so much, Annette. Um, okay, maybe it's a good time to introduce our third speaker. Uh, so we have Nicholas Larson, who's joining us uh, from the Copenhagen Institute uh, for Future Studies in Denmark. Um, and it's a, the, the Institute is a nonprofit think tank, as I understand it. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that he's uh, involved in there is uh, the Institute's Arts and Culture Research, Research and Initiatives. Uh, so actually, when uh, we came across Scott's project, it, it immediately reminded me of the, the project that you did, um, I think maybe about just under a year uh, before uh, this one came out, you know, so also very recent. Uh, and uh, it was called uh, Futures Shaping Art and Art Shaping Futures, uh, which I think is a really interesting uh, kind of tension, but also like 
productive um, loop, if I can say that. Uh, we'd really love to hear from you. Uh, what's your take on future of uh, arts and culture? Maybe if you could share a bit about that project as well, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And thank you, Scott and Annette. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I'm tuning in from Copenhagen in Denmark. And uh, I look forward to connect with all of you further uh, in this endeavor that we seem to have um, common interest in the future of arts and, and, and culture. I'm really impressed by both uh, Scott and Annette's take on this whole crowdsourced collective intelligence and that approach to, to what the future might hold. Um, but my route into this is a little different. I do, however, think that they complement each other quite good and is, is, we're up for a good discussion uh, later in, in this session. Um, I'm gonna start by saying how and whenever the future is brought up in, in, in everyday conversation, we often borrow the images and the language from us and, and culture and the many of the concepts that we imagine are, are, comes from there. Um, whether it's through movies, literature, speculative design, museum installations, these types of art forms and, and cultural outlets can help us understand our present and it can help us uh, to be provoked to think differently about the future, which is perhaps more important than ever. And with that in mind, I'm going to speak about my line of work here uh, in relation to the intersection of future studies, arts and culture, which I'm heading at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about this report that Cheryl mentioned. I'm gonna add a link in the chat. It came out late last year and it explores how art and future studies interrelate, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, in various ways. Feedback on the report is that it has a somewhat Nordic, out, Nordic centric outlook, so bear that in mind when you read it. Um, the early thoughts, however, on this report was that it, uh, it was also born out of, of, of COVID thinking, basically, uh, what this being culturally deprived mean for modern society? What are the younger generation's cultural consumption gonna look like? What new digital formats will be accelerated forward here? What does it mean for our mental health? Um, and what awaits us on the other side? And a particular interest was also the many statements that came from both uh, political bodies, uh, prominent media outlets and uh, intergovernmental institutions about how we were uh, potentially about to experience a new set of roaring 20s uh, and how arts and culture might be central agents for both COVID recovery and in the green transition. So this was like the starting, uh, starting point and, and the initial thinking, but rather than firmly stating that the future of arts and culture is gonna look like this and this is how it's gonna be used, we stayed in this explorative stage of these topics and our focus uh, as we started the research became more on how art is a sort of very unique and invaluable futures inquiry and how cultural institutions as, uh, can be places for dissemination of futures thinking. Uh, which we also often call uh, the democratization of futures literacy. And so the offset is how art is this indispensable tool for imagining futures that are different from the from mainstream conceptions. And some of the topics that we have in the report uh, are taking a careful look into how art can help us understand and expose hidden power structures in an increasing digital world. We look at how uh, how there's a new proposed definition on what the role and purpose of a museum should be, uh, where the new definition has a much more uh, has much more emphasis on the future, which I find interesting. It's not only about preserving the past. There's more balance in the in in, in the new definition. We also look at how nature's blueprint can inspire solutions uh, to, to human challenges, and we acknowledge that a lot of innovations start out as art forms. And from that point, we took a route into how sci-fi literature is increasingly being deployed in, in, in prototyping with uh, Kim Stanley Robinson at the COP26, for instance. Um, we are, generally, we ask this question, what happens if art sets the direction for development and technological development um, in particular? And a red threat is, uh, is, is how we can disseminate futures thinking through arts and culture. 
And in that notion, we are particularly interested in the branch of future studies called experiential futures, where futures are being brought to life from its often uh, written form, uh, which we then wrote about, which is uh, a paradox, I suppose. Um, the report is made on, on expertise and, and, and draws us on, on expertise from small and large local and international institutions. And there's a row of interviews where we de, de discuss dissolving the curatorial power, how art is becoming a more active agent, a gentle form of activism, it was mentioned as. And we also look at an intergenerational perspective to, um, to cultural heritage. And um, uh, I have to say that it's mellow, uh, developed with great help from, uh, from Aachen Museum of Modern Art and their art and tech lab here in, in, in just outside of Copenhagen. And we have uh, also got inspired by the great work from Center for Art, Design and Technology also here in Denmark. So the common denominator of our line of work is how we actively use art to help uh, people speculate about the future more so than saying what the future of arts and culture will look like, uh, because we can only assume, we cannot predict in my line of work. So we also do this with art schools, just to do another parallel track, and art students at the National School of Performing Arts, where emerging artists are being trained to generate form, craft new stories and performances about the future that has the purpose of catalyzing and co-creating with audiences in their practice, which is another example of how future studies and, and the artistic realm intertwines in beautiful ways. And finally, I want to I wanna share um, a short podcast series that I recently made with some of the collaborators of the report I just mentioned. It's called Techies and Artists in Conversations about Possible Futures, where it has tech culture and empathy at the core. The, the series asks questions like, uh, what comes after big tech? What happens when our realities get blurred with the arrival of the metaverse? How can we imagine reimagine digital infrastructures? And ultimately, how can we increase our cosmic care and sense of ecological connectedness uh, from an artistic and entrepreneurial approach? which has led to very interesting conversations that I hope you will listen to. I'll share that link as well. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And I think when you when you shared about, uh, you know, uh, using artists, I think the, the phrase you used was, uh, uh, you know, uh, artists as a, as, a, as a, sorry, especially like sci-fi writers, right? You mentioned sci-fi writers as a, as a kind of channel, I guess, you know, for um, thinking about the future, you know, what these images of the future, they made me think about H.G. Wells, right? And he's uh, credited in a BBC interview in the 1932 as saying, you know, as advocating for a field of study called the professors of foresight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, uh, and saying just as we, we spend time thinking about the context in which history is made, right? Understanding not only the actions and the actors, but the, 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 the spirit of the age, right? Uh, if history, right. we should do the same for foresight, right? We, for the future and think about what that context looks like for the future. What are these intended and unintended consequences? And I feel like so much of what you've shared uh, is really that exploratory space, you know, um, of actually what are these weird and wonderful futures <laughs> that we cannot yet anticipate. Thank you so much for your comments. Okay, uh, last but not least, I would like to invite um, Paul Tan. Uh, so Paul is uh, a poet and the former uh, deputy CEO of the National Arts Council in Singapore. Uh, so I understand that you're on sabbatical now, uh, Paul, pursuing your PhD. So I, I love that you've gone from policymaker to artist. <laughs> uh, I think it's a, a very unique uh, uh, kind of combination and, and point of view as well. Um, you know, I would really love to invite also your comments uh, and reflections, you know, on the future of arts and culture. Uh, thanks, Cheryl, and thanks to the LKYSDP school for inviting me. Uh, I come, you know, uh, in, the, in the shadow of uh, your, your previous speakers who all have uh, interesting research and landmark reports, of which I have none. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy to share my random observations. Uh, this comes from a corner of Singapore. For those of you who are not from Singapore, it's from uh, uh, the Nanyang Technological University where I'm pursuing my postgraduate in creative writing. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being an arts administrator for uh, quite a few years, about a decade, more than a decade at the Arts Council here in Singapore. Um, 
So I, I will just offer some observations. Uh, I, until last August, I was still serving in the council and you know, really in the thick of things with COVID. Uh, I, I would like to say that, you know, I hope that the observations here not just apply to the Singapore art scene, but broader as well. And the first observation I'll quickly make is that the artist is uh, you know, tremendously resilient and creative and passionate with a deep sense of purpose. And broadly, I don't see that changing. You know, I, I see that the artists have figured ways to uh, navigate uh, the, the, the tricky challenges posed by, by COVID. I think many of them have even uh, renewed their sense of purpose and, you know, used the opportunity to think about, you know, what their, 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 their arts and craft, what's the, 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 the arts for, you know, what, what does it mean to them and their practice? I'm happy to also say that I think generally society values the art. And I think, at least in Singapore, you know, the role of the artists over the years has, has become um, has evolved, has become seen and, and more highly valued, you know, over the years, you know, and your anecdote, you know, Cheryl, of uh, sending your leaders to, to a theatre programme, I mean, you know, warms the cockles of my heart, you know, and, and I, I think it's, 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 we need more people like yourself, you know, as, as much as society in Singapore values the artists, I think, you know, there can be more, you know, and, you know, hearing from all the different speakers, you know, from Nicholas thinking about how uh, arts can be used to envision, you know, the future, you know, and not just uh, uh, in the future in terms of the economy, the way society is structured. I think certainly that's one direction that, that I would like to see, you know, uh, 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 Singapore and, and actually the region actually move towards so that the arts is not just seen as something that is, you know, uh, on the side of, 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 of something that you do, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, something on the margins of, of, of your, your, your daily routine. Um, you know, earlier also Annette spoke about the blurring of the lines between uh, instru instrumentalizing the arts and arts for arts sake, and I, I cannot agree with her even more. Uh, I think that's that's an artificial binary, and I would certainly like us, you know, you know, to move in the direction where we see that arts has got a role to play. You know, uh, and it does not, you know, uh, necessarily, you know, mean that you are taking away anything from the artistic expression or the autonomy of the artistic practice. I think there are many kinds of convergences uh, that are possible. Um, so that's on, 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 the, on the positive side of things. But I, I think we also have to recognize that, that COVID uh, has, has also changed things, right? disrupted things in many real ways. I'll just offer one or two thoughts. You know, one is that you, you will have an audience for the last two years you know, who have, at least in Singapore, and I think in many parts of Southeast Asia, been uh, deprived of live performances. I mean, it's, it's slowly coming back, but in limited form and with certain strictures in place. And I think it's no different from many other parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and that means that, you know, for, for, for perhaps less impact on the adults, because one, once things get back to normal, you know, you, you know, life goes on. But I'm reflecting on students, you know, you're talking about a generation of young people for whom, you know, these are formative years. You know, and, and I think, you know, the, the way people develop uh, uh, or cultivate a love for the arts is about exposure when they're children, when they're school going, you know, when their teachers walk them through what they're going to see on stage or in a concert hall. And I fear, you know, that that, that is something that, that would be, uh, that might pose some kind of unintended uh, challenges that we may not see in future. I mean, already, even before COVID, we, we are talking about uh, uh, people who are uh, very reliant on their devices, who are not necessarily going out to live performances, and, and COVID has only kind of accelerated that trend. The other, other observation I'll make is perhaps less relevant to Singapore, but perhaps to some parts of the region, which is the reliance on tourism, right? I think even in Singapore, uh, our arts companies do have a certain percentage of their takings, uh, and certainly the museums as well, a certain percentage of their visitorship come from foreign visitors. Um, and certainly that has, has gone. But I think in Singapore, we're possibly less uh, reliant on, on, on tourism. But in other parts of Southeast Asia, for example, in traditional performing arts, right, whether you're talking about a Thai traditional dance or uh, a performance of the Ramayana in Yogyakarta, you know, that's where they are heavily reliant on, on arts tourism. And, uh, and it, it, it is something that is uh, part of the livelihood and actually part of the, the tourism economy in uh, various parts of, of Southeast Asia. And I suspect that there will be some very long lasting, enduring uh, negative impacts uh, that, that will come out as a result of COVID. To some extent, I will add that even for Singapore, I mean, the visual art scene, the commercial visual art scene, for example, uh, the art fairs 
and the commercial art galleries have always relied on uh, Southeast Asian visitors, especially Indonesian visitors, to help sustain uh, uh, the, the business. And I think with the borders uh, generally closed or just open at, at the best very little, uh, I think that has actually also affected uh, uh, the, the businesses, especially in the visual arts scene. Uh, on that note, uh, the tourism uh, having that impact. And of course, that links nicely to what Scott was talking about and that the challenges of the uh, thinking about business models. I think all across the art forms, whether it's museums, theaters, uh, commercial art galleries, um, uh, to a lesser extent, literature, I think, uh, I think everyone has had to uh, rethink about what the business model looks like. And I hope that, you know, that uh, we can also see that there are opportunities, uh, certainly in the space of uh, uh, technology and streaming, whether there are more things that we, we can explore more productively. I, I will end on a, on, a, on a philosophical note, which I think we touched on as well, which is about the metaverse and the way technology will move, you know, in a couple of years time. This is probably post-COVID, you know, and I, I was making an observation, I was thinking, you know, that actually, you know, we've always assumed that the artist has got agency, you know, it's a, the enlightenment project of the artist as a chronicler of the times and, you know, and someone with the, uh, you know, visionary uh, depth of, 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 of imagination. But I wonder whether that will be tested with the advances in technology, because already, you know, your, your, your machines are able to write poetry, albeit not very good, but I suspect if you make them do a haiku, they can do a pretty mean haiku, you know, uh, a machine can do a haiku quite well. And we've already seen uh, individual arts paintings being done uh, through machine learning as well. So if you just project much further down, you know, in a metaverse where you're interacting with all kinds of performers who are avatars, uh, you know, and having a really good time and these avatars are interacting with you, apparently as autonomous uh, uh, actors in your, 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 your metaverse world, you know, uh, but in reality, they're not, they're not, there's no artist behind it. It's just very sophisticated coding. So I, I do wonder whether, you know, if you, if you kind of project all the way down, whether even that agency and the autonomy of the artist would be tested. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would stop on that note. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. So many uh, really interesting uh, nuggets for kind of food for thought. Um, I really love how you brought up the next generation, actually, that for me was, uh, was something that uh, really resonated with me. I mean, we, we talk about the future of, the, of arts and culture, but actually, you know, what's the future's generation's take on that as well? Um, and I was just, I was so struck by this image of, you know, school children not being able to go to live theatre uh, anymore, right? You know, or, you know, having this gap in their formative years of not being able to have, have the experience as I have had growing up or falling in love with the arts because you are actually physically, you know, in a performance or experiencing music or something to that effect, right? Uh, and, and what does that mean for an embodied, <laughs> an embodied future? Like, I don't know, I don't, can't figure out, I don't quite have the language of, uh, of kind of articulating what, what I'm trying to say exactly, but, you know, it's this idea of like, when this digital future metaverse version, <laughs> you know, what have we lost as well in this kind of embodied, embodied uh, future of the arts? So... Curious, many, many uh, interesting food for thought. Uh, thank you so much for the, to the four of you uh, for sharing your, your insights and kind of opening remarks. Uh, I think given us a lot of really interesting, uh, provocative uh, thoughts, questions, uh, you know, to also consider, uh, you know, in this discussion. Uh, usually at this point of the conversation, we also like to open it up uh, to the floor, you know, to, uh, we do have a Q&A function, uh, you know, uh, uh, in addition to the chat, uh, it's easier for us to monitor the Q&A. So if you do have any questions, uh, reflections also, you know, that you would like to share, uh, any questions that you might have for any of the panelists, um, I would be really uh, curious to hear from you uh, and we could, could uh, take that uh, together. Uh, I, we see there's one from Jess. Uh, um, your thoughts on the characteristics of future artists uh, what would they look like be, uh, besides being more technologically savvy? Interesting. Is it future competency for artists? Is that the question? <laughs> Can I chip in, Cheryl? Yeah, go ahead. Um, starting off with the notion of the, of the future generations, 
I've come across several surveys and I work with, with, uh, with youth um, at schools here as well. And when we do this focus group and when, when, when we, we talk about the future of art and culture and, and when we look at these surveys, I think it's, it's, it's easy to see that they have their own idea of what constitutes creativity. There is, uh, there is some sort of discrepancy between the established art world and the younger generations today. They do not necessarily think that established arts and culture is for them. While they do think there's, and I'm generalizing here, right? But while there's the majority thinking that they are a very creative um, uh, gener uh, generation. So there is this um, new form of creativity emerging that probably relates to the creator economy, the being very uh, physically deprived of culture. So the digital forms accelerates forward. And I just think that we're seeing now a, a new, an emerging definition of what constitutes being an artist and what creativity is going to be. And we already see it now with the, with, with the whole search of, of NFT art, for instance. Um, creativity is definitely developing as a term. Fantastic. Um, any other comments, reflections on, on this question? Future competencies for artists, uh, my rephrasing, of course. I will, um, I will jump in. I think uh, what I find really interesting when I work with young artists, which I do a lot, uh, and I mentor a lot, is that um, there is a real interdisciplinarity, which I think was much less so when, when I was coming up, I went to the Dutch Art Academy, I studied video art, and I did photography next to it, where I ended up in theatre. So I do have some interdisciplinarity, but I think it's almost core to how many young artists see themselves. It's about the creativity is about exploring themes that are driven by big questions or they have a, a thematic context they work in or they're purpose driven. Um, and then they find the forms and the collaborators that allow them to do the work that is of interest and interesting and feel like that is right for the story or the expression made in the moment. And I'm really, I'm really excited about that. There is the questions around craft, but I think they're interested in craft as well. Hmm. It's just that they find some things just like the old school systems restrictive sometimes because they're quite expansive in the thinking. And for me, that's really, that's an exciting um, development and I feel like that also therefore that that interdisciplinarity that's baked into it also allows for those those partnerships beyond art forms those sort of partnerships and dialogues between the work and other institutions because they already have a complex uh, vocabulary to speak about their work yeah absolutely I mean I love what you said about, you know, kind of starting from those big questions, right? Big societal kind of grapplings, especially because that's also the intersection with the future, right? I used to teach a, a class here at the school, which was uh, kind of thinking about the big policy questions, the big societal questions, you know, all public policy. And then you talk about the medium and then you talk about the techniques and then you talk about, you know, kind of the case studies and so on. So there's, there's a really, there's a really interesting, you know, kind of uh, I would say point of view shift or frame of reference shift. Um, and I think Mei Ping's question here in the chat also kind of alludes to that a little bit, right? Uh, you know, so, so she asked about how arts can be elevated to become a means to inspire towards beauty, human quality, culture, communities, nations, you know, uh, that kind of thing, uh, rather than arts for art's sake, uh, which maybe lends itself more to what technology and, e and AI is able to do. Uh, any quick responses? Uh, and um, reflections on that, yeah. I have just had a thought about the, you know, some of the things that we that we kind of tapped into in the study. Um, you know, the idea of moving away from uh, a, a kind of global canon, you know, that's very Western and very Northern, and very classical, and very male driven, and being able to. Um, you know, there's so many regions of the world now that are able to actually express themselves globally from, uh, you know, and, and hear new voices emerge. I mean, this was several of the categories of drivers that were being kind of pushed to the top in this exercise was how, um, you know, technology in particular allows a new voice that's emerging in 
um, you know, in the Middle East or, or Southern Africa or um, in China in you know, in any kind of region of the world where it might have been harder to hear and see, um, can now connect with audiences who can who can um, enjoy it, appreciate it, and reward it in some ways. And so that's there were there was definitely kind of a sense of I, I'm thinking particularly within the um, kind of Middle East context, you know, where you've got a kind of cultural opening that's happening right now across a number of different countries. The the um, the sort of desire to bring unheard voices and to kind of enable people who hadn't even seen themselves as a, in a kind of role in the arts to uh, to sort of express and share. And there's a lot of, but, but that also requires infrastructure. It requires, you know, a lot of other things to beyond simply um, the single artist creating or the sort of small community creating, but that ability to kind of reach deeper <laughs> and find hidden voices, I think, is a really interesting um, kind of component of where we're headed. And that, I think, goes to some of what maybe being talking about in this question. You know, you can appreciate more about the stories of different cultures by hearing them directly, rather than having them mediated through CNN International or, you know, some large uh, uh, producer that they've kind of floated up to. Maybe if I could just add on um, to, to, to what's been said, um, I think uh, one of the things that I think would be good to happen and it's already happening is for, for, for many people in this part of the world to think about what uh, types of arts and how what are their internal sense of merit or priority. Uh, even just now, I mentioned the word traditional arts, right? And, and, and what kind of meanings does that con, uh, you know, carry? And I think increasingly, as uh, uh, I think also as Asia becomes more affluent and with the rise of an, an ascendant China, I wonder whether some of those categories, which are borrowed from you know uh, Western discourse, whether those would be revisited. Um, the idea of uh, I mean these are words which exist that I didn't invent them like traditional arts. What does that mean, right? Uh, or even worse, ethnic arts, right? Which which. Uh, uh, yeah, I know, you know, I mean, I, I've still heard it. Well, fortunately not in Singapore, but I mean, it's still, it's still, it's still a phrase that's banded around, right? And, and the kinds of uh, values you're ascribing to, to, to that. I think there's a wealth of knowledges here that, that can be tapped on. And I think, you know, I, I wonder whether we can use our imagination, which I think all, all people in the arts community have, to try and harness those kind of knowledges and, and kind of revisit, you know, uh, 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 what, what, what genre means, you know. And I think that I'm also in some ways kind of addressing uh, Mohammed's uh, uh, questions about, you know, future, you know, and, and in, in the next decade, because I hope that we can also blur, blur those lines. In some ways, the East-West divide is also not very helpful in some ways. Uh, but I think it's also important for, for those uh, artists in, in, in Singapore, in this part of the world, to kind of think about, you know, how education, how our context has shaped, you know, our knowledge and the way we see the world. And then whether we can actually kind of deconstruct that, you know, and think about, about all the knowledges that are also uh, uh, otherwise maybe marginalized or not, not so much in the spotlight. Yeah, thanks. Can I, can I jump on that? Of course, go ahead. Um, I just just listening to to Paul and uh, Scott before I was just reminded of um, an article written by uh, Ashish Nandi. I think it's really old. I think it's like a couple of decades old about bearing witness to the future, which is a sort of um, I was introduced to by a futurist, Stuart Candy, who I talk with a lot. Experimental experiential futures as an immersive theatre director. It's all the same, but I think. I think that idea of different forms of knowledge, embodied knowledge, knowledge created, uh, knowledge that is, is present within indigenous culture, in different culture in, that are that's embedded in experience is really interesting. I've I come from that space as a theater maker, and now very recently being a senior visiting fellow at a university, sort of experiencing. Um, definitions of knowledge in a very different way in a, uh, for the first time. I feel like arts and culture is a really great space to open up those different forms of knowledge and expertise of being, both, both old and new. And that idea of bringing diverse point of views together to find where the divergences and overlaps lie, like what makes us all human and what makes us, uh, what is connected, but also what's specific and, and 
what is wisdom that comes out of my context and what is wisdom that comes out of another context and, and how do they exchange? I think one of the things that I find really useful to think about, so you, because there's the role of the artist and creativity, but there's also for me the role of the art institution. And I was reminded by, um, I think, you know, Nicholas was talking about the democratization of these processes, like how do we open up spaces? And I think cultural institutions are spaces that could take a role collectively with others in this. There is a really helpful uh, report that was created by the Gulbenkian Institute in the UK, which breaks it down into, I'm doing this by heart, so bear with me, a parks, like the culture institution as a park, as a public space together, uh, a temple, like a, a place for contemplation and thought, a uh, home, I think, um, so a sense of belonging and community, a sense of a safe place, uh, a school, I think, or university, a place of lifelong learning. And that I think is really important in, um, in creating a healthy society with, with great civic discourse in it. And then a town hall, like a place for discussion. And those things uh, live on the intersection between the imagination of professional artists and audience. And I think that gathering space of resource, money, <laughs> money and space and time with artists and creativity that facilitate and open up, but also audiences for, for that dialogue to happen, I think is a really interesting space when we think about futuring policy and, and the role of arts and culture in that. If I can jump in quickly here, I just wanna say that I 100% see it as a golden opportunity for institutions like museum or museums or other cultural institutions and outlets. Um, to engage wider audiences in, in, in futuring uh, or questioning, participating basically, rather than just spectating uh, as, as the more traditional form um, ha has been. And the good news is that through my work with the Futures Oriented Museum Synergies Network, I can testament that there is a lot going on globally in this state. Uh, many cultural leaders are, are beginning to, to explore and understand their, uh, their possible role in, in this dissemination of, of futures thinking and conversations about the future and how to bring, bring uh, go beyond the walls, the confined space of the building and how to look at their role as more of like a, a space for sanctuary and, and you said belonging and that, uh, that's exactly it. That's generally a space for sense making and co-creation. Um, um, could could give cultural institutions like museums a new purpose and a new role in society going forward. Fantastic. I mean, you know, I mean, I think it's um, there are a lot of kind of intersections between arts and uh, arts as a practice and futures as a practice. You know, I think uh, a couple of themes that have come up is you know how both try to create a container for these messy kind of conversations, right? Uh, I think that that's one. I think the other one is also maybe a, a safe space for questioning these definitions, right? Trying to category break, definition break, um, you know, questioning these assumptions also kind of a key contribution to both of both the arts practice and the futures practice. And I think the last one is really asking the question, who owns the future, right? Whose voices are represented, not represented? Who gets to make that expression? Whose knowledge is legitimized or not legitimized? I feel like, you know, all these are actually really interesting intersection between the world of arts and the world of uh, futures that we can definitely uh, learn from and contribute to each other. Uh, we've got, got a couple more questions. Uh, then maybe I would start with, uh, you know, kind of maybe following on that theme, you know, so uh, Roberto has asked about, uh, you know, would the freedom that characterizes arts and artists, you know, help to remove conscious or unconscious biases in thinking about the future, uh, you know, kind of thinking a little bit more about that intersection. And if I, if I can throw another spanner into the work, how can this contribute to policy making and kind of better public policy? I'm curious too. I can go. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to start another place and hopefully end at a proper answer. Um, 
what, what I find very beautiful about the intersection of future studies and arts is that uh, having worked a decade in future studies, a lot of the engagement and activity here is project-based. It's not necessarily culture-oriented. Like it's only now that we are beginning to talk about how to cultivate an anticipatory culture in institutions and organizations. So what is the, the, the majority of the work is being done is doing to plan or prepare for the future where you more often than not extend the past. The art practice, the artistic practice, the creative world allows us to speculate and explore new things or see new perspectives because we are curious and often perhaps coming from a more hopeful outlook than when we have to plan or prepare based on innovation and risk agendas. So allowing ourselves to speculate about possible futures through the artistic realm can open up the imagination in, in new ways. And, and I think that's a valuable contribution uh, to anything uh, as well as policy making show. Fantastic. Any other further reflections? I see Scott's just unmuted. <laughs> I've uncloaked. Um, <laughs> exactly. No, I think. You know, I think it's if you're coming from the future side of the field, and I was I, this is making me realize I started in an art school. I uh, actually started in theater school many, many, many years ago um, and found my way to futures work uh, about two decades ago. And uh, it wasn't until, you know, sort of the early 2000s and working with some professionals who were kind of putting the two together that I really, you know, quickly kind of saw the value of it, of getting off the page and, and off the whiteboard and into, you know, material interaction. And, but when you think about it, you know, uh, art, just to kind of throw an, an Olaf Helmer thing in here, you know, art is a social technology. Um, art and culture are as useful a, a kind of soft technologies in terms of exploration of ideas as any, you know, graph chart matrix method, um, you know, that we bring from the kind of drier side of futures work into the picture. Um, you know, as a, as a futurist, I've been exhibited in, I think about a half dozen museums now, which is not something I would have thought my work would have done. Um, as a team, I'm the only non-artist here. My colleague Susan is an artist and designer. Madeline, who I co-wrote the book with, is a science fiction novelist. We kind of unconsciously have integrated that into the work um, as a means of making this crossover. The, we're, it didn't start with us. You know, it started, as you say, very, very early on. Um, you know, bringing it back to policy. Uh, Rand, um, you know, Rand Corporation is sort of the, you know, one of the sort of seed beds of modern futures work, um, you know, was very much interested in exploring the sort of intersection of art and technology and art and futures. There's a great essay called Aesthetic Strategist about Albert Wallstetter, who was, uh, you know, a kind of defense analyst at Rand, um, you know, who was really advocating bringing sort of modernism and, and modernist art and thought into the sort of policy futures realm and, and making it explicit rather than having it just kind of be something that you critique 30 or 40 years later. And even, you know, the classic stories of Herman Kahn and Leo Rostin, and, you know, Kahn, uh, you know, the sort of consummate uh, Cold War futurist Leo Rostin, a poet and screenwriter, you know, coming together in the Hollywood Hills to work out the use of scenario from and the sort of appropriation of it from film and stories as a term to ex to ex explain what scenario thinking could do. Yeah, um, it's about narrativizing complexity <laughs> and making explicit choices. Um, and I think so. These things have always been kind of tied up together, whether it's Bell Labs and creative R and D. You know, there's a very, very rich history of the convergence of futures and art and culture. Uh, and I think it's kind of heading into another big kind of golden age, uh, particularly as we understand more explicitly what that convergence looks like. Can I offer a quick response to Roberta's question? Yeah, um, please go ahead. Just a comment about machines and algorithms. Mm. I mean, there's a part of us, you know, and I think, you know, uh, maybe it's, it's a legacy of romanticism and it's, you know, the, the enterprise of enlightenment that we think that, of course, it's not possible for a machine to ever create an Anton Chekhov play or a Raymond Carver short story. It's just not possible because there's so much context and the humanity in it. So there's a part of me that, that 
agrees with that, that, you know, that, that the profoundly human aspect of, of arts and its connection to humanity is something that a machine will, will never learn. But will I say never, never? Am I going to, you know, bet my life on it? Uh, no, because, you know, if I turn the clock back just 20 years ago, I would not have envisaged even the smartphone, you know, that is already beyond my imagination 20 years ago, right? So uh, who's to say that the machine and the algorithms won't be able to create a Chekhovian play or a Raymond Carver short story if it figured it out enough? I mean, whatever that would take, right? So, so that's, that's one, one immediate immediate thought. The second thought is actually about the market. To me, that there is market and there's market. I think when the market is speculative and bandwagon, and I'm talking about NFTs, mm. right? Uh, I, 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 I would appreciate that, 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 that point that he's making, right? That art seems to be detached from the artistic source. And what is driving that is perhaps, you know, a different kinds of motivation, you know, and, and, and not, not really about understanding the profound humanity in a piece of work. I, I take that point completely. But I would like to say that even if you didn't have the market in the first place, then actually a lot of arts would not get to the consumer, you know, whether it's mediated through a Broadway theatre show or whether through the commercial publishing world to get your, 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 your latest uh, novel, you know, literary fiction, you know, or whether it's a commercial gallery, which I, you know, which I spoke about earlier, who actually needs to work with an artist, you know, to try and figure out to, how to get the work out to an audience. It just so happens that the audience is also one that collects art and therefore is part of the market. So to me, the market itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, just, just my, my 20 cents worth. Thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. Can I invite any other responses, comments before we, I say, Annette, go ahead. So I too got very stuck on Roberta's question because it's beautiful <laughs> and there is a, um, a sort of tension in there. Because I think for me, um, Annette, I think you're, um, hmm. Oops, I think you're frozen. <laughs> I, I can hear you, Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Suspect, oh, some of us are frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to tell. Um, it's okay. We can come back to Annette. Um, I think it's also time to maybe start to, oops, she's completely dropped off. <laughs> Oh no, I hope we have a chance to hear from her uh, before we, we start to wrap up the session. Um, but I do want to, to note the time as well, you know, um, and, uh, you know, maybe this is a good time to start to kind of wrap up, you know, the discussion a little bit. Uh, it's, a, it's a wide ranging one, you know, I think when you see the title of a, a uh, webinar like this, The Future of Arts and Culture, you know, exactly like um, uh, what uh, Quan Chen uh, mentioned in the question, you know, it kind of suggests a forecasting, right? of a state of play, you know, um, you know, what does, what is the future of the arts going to be some sort of predictive crystal ball gazing uh, um, kind of uh, response, perhaps, uh, you know, and, and I, I think if you, um, you know, and, and that could be one take on it, but I do hope that our conversation has also suggested, you know, that actually there's a lot that the arts world can learn from the futures world and the futures world can learn from the arts world and within this great intersection um, is something that I hope that, you know, kind of contributes, you know, to the greater texture and nuance of the space. Um, I think maybe as, as a closing uh, round of reflections, I do hope that Annette is able to come back at some point <laughs> before we finish up. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we are a public policy school and we spend all our time, uh, almost all our time, uh, uh, speaking to public um, policymakers and, and, you know, their, their kind of um, obsessions and preoccupations, you know, with, with trying to make policy in this uh, changing and complex world. Uh, you know, what, what is one thing that you hope that, uh, you know, the future of arts and culture might be able to respond to? the world of public policy, you know, contribute to the world of policy, maybe a, maybe a better framing, uh, you know, just as a closing, maybe a quick reflection to round up our time together. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think 
you know, one of the things that has come out of some early conversations around the, the, the work that, that Annette and I have done in this with the study has been, um, you know, the, the fact that some very hard choices are going to be forced upon us by things like climate change. Um, yes, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but we're going to have some, some pretty serious priorities in place. And I think um, rather than having to look at them as a kind of zero sum, you know, as a binary, we can deal with climate or we can fund culture or we can support culture or whatever it's going to be. So it's to to um, come back to the idea of how central and how critical the arts and culture will be in helping us make that kind of that transit, helping us make the journey through, as you said at the very beginning, you know, the 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 exercises you were doing with art science and what I was headed there to do was that the very issue of how do we use this as a way of processing what's going on and making sure we can see everyone. <laughs> Uh, making sure that we can that that people's you know very different people's needs are visible uh, through uh, what's going to be in a kind of you know Pierre Wack term the rapids uh, that we're about to transcend or we're already transcending. So I think policymakers need to kind of keep that central in their thinking about how what role arts and culture can play as a as a um, as a support mechanism as a a means of coping as a, a means of exploration of other possibility uh, and, uh, and how that can be supported through policy. Great, thanks so much. Just to catch you up, uh, Annette, we are doing a closing round of reflections. Uh, we can cut, we can also take your, your uh, uh, comments uh, from before, uh, before you got cut off, um, but we're, we're just reflecting on the question about what, uh, you know, arts and culture can kind of, or the future of arts and culture can contribute to the policy making space. Uh, and so just doing a quick round of reflections. So we've just started with Scott. Uh, maybe I'll ask either Nicholas or Paul to jump in, uh, just to give Annette a little bit of time to settle back in. <laughs> Nicholas, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm going to read you a quote from the report and then uh, bend it to how I think it, uh, it, it supports policymaking. And I asked a, uh, a guy called Paul O'Neill that we interviewed from a Finnish arts institution and what his take on the future art institution would look like. And he said it's inclusive and transdisciplinary. Mm. The moments of education or display and, uh, and participation are equal. It supports diverse practices. It's less white. It's certainly more queer and more feminist. It listens more than it speaks. And when it speaks, it's aware of how it speaks and on behalf of others. It works in contrast to continuous monoculture by constantly being in dialogue with others than its, pat uh, with others than its patrons and its ticket holders. It sees beyond the wealthy and the people attending to mega exhibitions who often do not view the experience as being something which can transform, change, or challenge the culture that they live in. And I think that's such a beautiful take on what the future of an arts institution could look like and what, 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 uh, what can inspire the, the, the journey forward. Uh, if you think the future of arts and culture is a bit messy, I think that sums it up pretty, pretty well. And then I also want to uh, add an end comment on uh, how cultural coverage uh, and the political realm is moving closer together. Um, you can argue that arts and uh, arts has always been commenting or serving critique, uh, but it's coming much more of an active agent uh, due to its speculative properties. And, and a, a particular case in the UK where people uh, turning over statues are not being uh, punished for it, even though it's an official crime, because it taps into a new discourse and understanding and discussion in terms of where we're going as a society. And that is where art can inspire um, policy development or understanding of the future of policy as well, I think. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll go next and uh, leave Annette to have the last word. <laughs> Fantastic. You, know, you, you get to you know, wrap up everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would reframe this uh, question that you posed, the intriguing question, Cheryl, in this way. I would say, if I have Singapore public servants in the room, what would my pitch be? Yes. And my pitch would be this. <laughs> Look, the arts can do more than you think, right? I'll broadly mention three things. One is livability in terms of how it makes Singapore a more livable place. And, and that is connected to the idea of aesthetics and pleasure. 
right? And I wouldn't underestimate the importance of that in making a place a livable, lovable place. The second point I'll make is about how arts can bring about a thinking population, right? Whether it's you're looking at very difficult Shakespeare, Chaucer, you know, or looking or, or breaking down a piece of, of art from the Nanyang period and analyzing what social realism means for Singapore, I would like to think that the arts the pitch would be that it helps you develop a certain crit critical faculty. And the third point I'll make as a pitch to the Singapore public servants who may be in the room would be that how the arts can strengthen communities, whether it's about bringing communities together to reflect on the localized identities or the local issues or the local aesthetic or the local uh, flavor of that area. You know, there's a lot that the arts can bring and memorialize, right? Uh, if it is documented and, and become something that's part of the, the fabric of the people and actually strengthen communities. So now with that pitch in mind, then I would throw the question back at the Singaporean public servant to then say, how then can the arts make your work better? Mm. Well, thanks. Fantastic question. And uh, last but not least, Annette, uh, so glad that you managed to uh, come back and we managed to catch your closing remarks. <laughs> we don't miss you out, but we would love to hear from you. Yeah, apologies for the technical hitch. Um, I mean, first of all, everything Paul just said. I would <laughs> it's, very, it's, it's really interesting. I think we from Arts and Culture are really looking at um, who and what we are serving at the moment. It is about imagination. It is about connection. It is about transcendence and joy, as Paul said. We, we don't always have to be great workers we can also be great humans and some of, you know, beauty and transcendence has a purpose beyond just instrumentalism. Well, going to the instrumentalism, I do think that um, there is, arts and culture can help in collaboration with um, the social and political systems in places to help think about how one for citizens and communities gone again you're okay Hang okay on. great um, you know a richer experience of both the future the past and the present and it can it's really important and I think it can help keep reinventing reinventing public life especially in this time of chaos and change where we are continuously questioning how we live with climate change with with a new discourse about equity um, where we look ahead in, in a shifting world, a world that, that is going, that's both global and local, that has digital and physical experiences. There's so many big questions right now. So reinventing the role of public life in that and the role of imagination in that, um, the gathering of people around said ideas is I think where the role of art and culture might lie. And that, you know, to jump on, on Paul's bandwagon, Oh no. Oh no. Yes, you're back. <laughs> right. I am bandwagon. <laughs> Jumping on Paul's bandwagon, I think for me the question is how do policymakers and art and culture work together to provide richness and mm -hmm. meaning um, and purpose to our local communities and the global connections we want to make for uh, about big ideas? Fantastic. And thank you so much, everybody, for, for the uh, wonderful, wonderful comments. I'm really glad to be able to spend this hour, hour and a bit <laughs> uh, with the four of you, you know, kind of exchanging ideas on, on this intersection of arts and culture, futures and public public policy uh, very broadly, you know, and, and, and what does this look like is a uh, maybe a not so commonly combined intersection, um, but really glad that, you know, that all of you bring bring your own embodied uh, combinations, uh, you know, to the to this conversation really appreciate appreciate that. Uh, you know, for those of you who are still um, uh, joining us on the webinar, I would just like to say, I think for me, the big two takeaways, uh, the first one is, is really just to encourage all of you to uh, continue to, co to think about what are these big questions of the future of humanity, society, you know, as Annette has, has pointed out, and find your own expression of that, right, whether it's through arts or futures or public policy or whatever else it might be, uh, really, really, um, uh, you know, hope that that's something that you can explore. And go and see an arts thing. <laughs> see, experience, read, uh, you know, uh, visit. 
you know, uh, it would be su such a wonderful, uh, I would say, thanks to the arts community also for, um, you know, their contribution, you know, to, to our lives during this pandemic as well, you know, giving us this richness and so on. Thank you very much to all the panel uh, and thank you everybody who's been joining us. I think we've got a couple of announcements uh, just to wrap up um, uh, the session. Uh, the first one is feedback. Uh, I was saying all of last year that it was the first time that we were running a webinar series, but now that we are uh, <laughs> doing it for the second year, uh, I say well, now that we've changed theme and changed track a little bit, you know, this is our first attempt at doing something that's more topical. Uh, personally, I'm thrilled at how it's gone and, uh, you know, the different intersections of the conversation is really what we're trying to explore in this webinar series. Uh, but if you can be so kind as to uh, give us some feedback, uh, the QR code is on the screen. Uh, that would be really useful in terms of our future planning. If you can also suggest what you might like to hear from us in terms of different topics, that would also be really great. I'll give it another couple of seconds. Uh, okay, so the next episode in conjunction with International uh, Women's Day uh, is going to be on gender equality, uh, future, future of gender equality still, um, and that will be at the end of March. Uh, so again, you know, do hope that you would join us. Uh, as you can see now, uh, we are looking at um, doing this webinar monthly uh, and we'll choose a different theme every month. Uh, you know, so do hope that you'll be interested in, in joining us for the different conversations as well. Maybe the next slide. Um, and as usual, you know, so uh, we get a lot of uh, questions about our, our programs. Uh, and uh, just to mention that we've got a number of open enrollment runs uh, coming up. Uh, the QR code will give you more information about the programs generally. Um, but, you know, I think the one that's coming up, the, the uh, kind of, the next is uh, the, the our Futures for Public Policy program happening in person. Uh, so you do have to be able to come to Singapore uh, to 8th or to 11th of March. Uh, and uh, there is also an early bird discount that's kind of happening if you can sign up by the end of February. Uh, our Futures Masterclass, so if you're based overseas and prefer to do that online, our Futures Masterclass is also happening from end April to May. Uh, and then we've got a number of other open enrollment programs. We don't just do futures. <laughs> uh, the executive education department here at the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, covers a very wide range of policy areas. So whether it's communications, behavior change, uh, reinventing organizations in terms of like uh, agility and cultural diversity, you know, all, all these um, uh, conversations, you know, very much uh, looking at I would say the, the cutting edge of public policy uh, thinking and, and looking at uh, yeah what, what these interesting conversations look like. Uh, and of course, please keep in touch. I'm sure I know many of you follow us on LinkedIn and that's how you get information. Uh, but uh, if you want to collaborate on futures or any of our executive education programs, the emails are there or you can scan the QR code for LinkedIn. Uh, yes, the in-person uh, courses are also available for international applicants if you're able to travel uh, to Singapore uh, for, that, for that period. So thank you, everybody. Um, and especially thank you once again to our wonderful panelists for spending this last hour and 15 minutes with us. Uh, really grateful for your insights and sharing your body of work and your rich experience. Uh, it's been really wonderful and thought-provoking. And uh, it leaves me then to kind of close off this uh, webinar series, the first one for our year of the tiger, the Lunar New Year. Um, and just want to say uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, wish you a great rest of your day, whatever time you are joining us from. So take care and see you at our next webinar. <laughs>